Um, <laughs> yeah, a little awkward topic, but hey, it's in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, look, that's that's the topic. It's in uh, that's Ephesians chapter. We're still in Ephesians. Uh, we'll probably be here for a while. We're still working through Ephesians. Uh, but Paul made some really interesting statements about this word, and I want you to, to make a different connection in your mind. When you see and hear the word um, uh, circumcision in the New Covenant and in the New Testament, I want, I want you to see some different. Turn with me um, to Ephesians chapter 2, and this is verse 11 through 13. Turn with me there to Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Paper guys are kind of slow there, but it's okay. <laughs> Trying to get your paper, paper Bible going. All right, Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in your flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, Remember that you are at one time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and the strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, you were formerly far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So if you notice in the text, um, it has that word uncircumcision in quote marks. It has the word being called circumcision, and it even has the parenthetical to say by the so-called circumcision. Now, for most of us, when you think of circumcision, it's pretty much the, most, the common thing. It's um, if in the Jewish culture, um, it's the only major religion that still has as a right, R-I-T-E, not R-I-G-H-T, a rite of passage where the males are circumcised. And basically what that means, if you don't know what circumcision is, is that the foreskin of a male has been removed after the eighth day. So when in any circumcision, there's always blood that's shed, right? And it's, it's removed by somebody's hand. Some doctor does a bris, and oh, I'm sorry, some rabbi will do a bris or, or, or whatever. And the whole point is that there is a removal of something and it's removed by hands and that's the contrast i believe the apostle paul is trying to get you to think of because the apostle paul was a jew he's a self-proclaimed pharisee and it, it's believed and, and the pharisees were actually um, jews that were probably 100 years before the time of christ and they were the ones that really kept firm to the law they kept firm to the understanding of scripture it's probably understood that when Jesus was saying in, in John, he says, you search me because in them you think you'll find eternal life, he's probably talking to Pharisees. And Pharisees are probably the group of people that were most connected to Jesus. Jesus rebuked scribes, he rebuked Pharisees, he rebuked different types of religious groups, but something about the Pharisees really had a connection with Jesus. They really, there was something about him that they connected with. If you think about it, there was Joseph of Arimathea, who was also a Pharisee that connected with Jesus. You had Nicodemus at night who came and had this dialogue with Jesus. And so Pharisees had this thing with Jesus. So, in the, so when Paul is making this reference as a Pharisee, there's something that's coming to his mind. I'm telling you, he's not thinking about snip snip. He's thinking about something else. And my hope is that we'll make that connection. And that's what happens as we are walking through a process, as you're learning something new, as you're walking through um, your relationship with God, you, you kind of have to form new ideas and new thoughts in your mind as you walk it through. And I think when Paul looked at this, he, in his mind, something came to mind. But I want you to make sure you have the same thing come into mind. So it's like if I were to say to you, if I would say to anyone in this room, hasta la vista. Of course, you know, you know how to end that. I'll be, everybody knows how to end that. You, you can't handle the, right. We, we all know that because there's a reference point in our mind when we hear it. What's the reference point that Paul is trying to get us to by using the word uncircumcision and by using the word circumcision? I think it was this. 
Turn into Genesis chapter 17 and verse 10. Let's turn to Genesis 17 and verse 10. I think this was what he had in mind. He says, this is my covenant, which shall which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male shall be circumcised and you shall be, a, I'm sorry, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be what? A sign of the covenant between me and you. So for us, when we think circumcision, we think snip, snip. But for Paul, when he was thinking circumcision, he's thinking, sing it with me, we're in, we're in, we're in, we're in. He's thinking in Christ. He's thinking, wait, covenant. He's thinking, this is my covenant which I shall keep with you. And of course, if you think of the reference in his mind, in Paul's mind, he knows it. He's been a Jew for his entire life. He walks through the process. So he remembered the day, well, he was eight years old, but he's probably been around enough bris in his time. And so the point here is that the Apostle Paul is thinking covenant. And when we're thinking covenant, whose covenant are we thinking? We're thinking of the covenant that God made with Jesus that you're in, you're included in. You're in this covenant that God has made and you get to be, you then make this covenant, you can't break this covenant because you have been placed in this covenant because of Jesus. And this, so, so as we go through one or two scriptures about this idea of circumcision, I want you to think circumcision, not snip, snip, think in Christ think this is what he is saying. Now let's walk back to the, the first verse, the first text. Therefore you were formerly Gentiles in the flesh who were called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, um, which was performed by hands. You were formerly called Gentiles in the flesh. And what's interesting is that he says, that's what you were, but now you're different. He says, because of you were once called that, that was the nickname that those, to an audience of Jews and non-Jews, when you say circumcision and non-circumcision, the first thing come to mind is covenant of Abraham promises, we're in, you're not. And so he's saying, hey, you were, you were formerly called Gentiles in your flesh, called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which was performed by flesh. Remember that you were separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. All of that is language that a Jew would clearly and completely understand on the commonwealth of Israel. Um, separate, so coming from, made, performed by human hands. And were strangers to the promise, having no hope without God. Then verse 13 is what I like. But now in Christ. All of that, he, he says, I know what you were called. I know you were outside. I know that you didn't have a recognition of what I've done. But now, verse 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly afar off, what are you now? You've been brought near by the blood of Jesus. You've been brought near by a cutting of a covenant. You were brought near because of a circumcision of heart. You were brought near because Christ has come in you. In every covenant, in every covenant that exists, there's always two things that happens. There's one, there's a shedding of blood. And two, there's always somebody has to do something. Now that becomes the question, what's the covenant that Christ has did with Jesus and God what was your role in that covenant? How hard did you have to work to be in that covenant? It wasn't a whole lot of working. Here's a reference that I, I, I heard re recently. If I were to tell you that, I, let, let's say I have this real cup of water, and I'm not going to do this because it's not going to happen. Well, let's say I have this cup of water, and I say, Thelma, I am going to pour this cup of water completely on your head. Okay, you're such an obedient soul. She says, do it. <laughs> All right, 
So let, let, me, let me take someone who is a little more rebellious. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> so let's say I decide to pour. She's like, okay, whatever. What if I say to you, when I'm finished pouring this cup of water on, her, on your head, when the next time you log on to your bank account, you're going to see a million dollars. Oh, oh, we, oh, we got some more volunteers. Oh, we got some more volunteers. Oh, oh, it's Dios mío. So that's the case. What would be your reaction besides, I saw the reaction. The reaction was, come on. What are you waiting on? Do it. What would it look like? What would, what would you say to the person who pulls on an umbrella at that point? That's what works looks like. That's what your efforts look like. That's what you often try to do in here. He is saying, I want to go ahead. I have done this for you. The covenant that I've made with you. Here's the work that I need you to do. I'll take it. That's the difference with the old covenant that was made by hands. The old covenant was one that was in the flesh, but the new covenant is one. And we hear this word new covenant all the time in the text. The new covenant not made by hands, but this new covenant is one that you receive. You say, yes, God, according to thy word, be it unto me. Think about what the Abrahamic covenant was a great prophetic picture. Do you remember how Abraham, that covenant came with Abraham? He says, Abraham, I'm about to make a covenant with you. He's like, do it. First of all, go to sleep. He actually put Abraham to sleep. And then he cut the covenant. And then Abraham woke up. What's happening? Oh, I guess we're in the Abrahamic covenant now. The new covenant and the covenant that Christ has made with you, this circumcision not made by hands, it doesn't require your effort. It doesn't require your spiritual effort. It, the, here's, what, here's what the effort looks like. Yes, Lord. That's what, that's what effort in the new covenant looks like. Yes, Lord. I receive it. So when you see, hey, believe it, do be it unto me according to thy word. Yes, I receive it. And this is so powerful in, in, in the text. I, I see a bunch of these things in, in the Old Testament covenant. What, what Jesus did, it applies and it works through for us when we say, yes, Lord. Th think about the, the prophetic picture in the book of Exodus. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Right? Remember that one in the New Testament? So think of in the Old Testament, let's say there was five people in the house. And they knew angel of death is going to show up any minute now. So what are the guys, what was the response of the person in the house when he knew the angel of death's going to, what, what's his response? I better go outside and make sure that there's the blood thing out there. That was his thing. Because how, how does it work? When he sees the blood, everyone that's covered in that household was saved. When God, what Christ did for you on Calvary, what Christ did for you by bringing you into new covenant, when he's drawn you in yeah. to this new covenant, he is saying, the mere fact that you're in, you're fully protected. If when the things come over and pass over, I am protecting you. That's how the new covenant works. The old covenant, you had to do something. There was effort. In this covenant, it, the effort started on Jesus' part. He paid. What, did, you, did any of you die on a cross? Nope, no one died on the cross. You're still here, yeah. right? Thank <laughs> you, still here. Did anybody, you, would any of you like to die on a cross? No, because Christ did that all for you on Calvary. What's your response? Yes, Lord. I receive it. I, I believe it. So in the New Covenant, he says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Here's another really interesting one. I don't know if you ever remember that text in, and this is not an obscure text, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14. It says that the unbelieving spouse is sanctified or is made holy by the believing spouse. 
That ain't an obscure text in the Old Testament. That's 1 Corinthians 7. That's seven chapters into Paul's message, right? But that to me is part of what it looks like to be in the covenant. You thought that you were unholy, but because of the husbandman, which is Jesus, the bride, the, the bridegroom Jesus, he has said, because I'm holy and you're in me, guess what you are? Holy. That's how much work did you have to be to become holy? It was, didn't seem to be a lot of work, did it? What was the answer? Yes, Lord. I receive what Christ has done inside of my heart. And so I, I find that fascinating to, to know that, and, and by the way, I kind of put a little asterisk there, that scripture is not saying that, that if you have a relationship with a jerk, you go ahead and marry him because you being pure will sanctify the unbelieving, right? That, that, that's not what that text is saying. That's not what that text is saying. Um, I gotta make those kinds of asterisks uh, now. But what, what, what it, it is giving us a picture, it's giving us a great picture of what it means like to be in Christ. It's given us that, that story. Here's, here's the, other, the other one in the text that I've, I'm so, I marvel at it. You remember the guys who brought, who went to Jesus with their friends and they smashed up the guy's roof and they lowered his body down because there's too many people in the room? If you were the buddy, what would you say? Guys, listen, I ain't got that insurance money to pay for his roof. Why are you breaking his roof up? Hey guys, you know, um, this is stupid. This is stupid. Like, okay, yeah, I know that there's a lot of people there. I know we've heard a lot of great stories about this Jesus guy, but let's not make a scene. Let, let's not do this stuff. But those, his buddies decided to say, you know what? We're doing this. And because of the faith of his buddies, they break up the guy's roof. I don't know what roofs were made of back then. <laughs> I don't think it was, but my boss would be happy to hear that. If, if. So these roofs, like I, I know that there were people would, people would stand on roofs. I, I think they were a pretty big deal. Because if you read the book of Matthew, it talks about people who are on their roofs. So I think those roofs were pretty firm. So I don't know what it took for these guys to destroy somebody. I hope it was that guy's house. I hope it was his house that he destroyed his own roof. Like, imagine if you're doing a house meeting. We, we did a house meeting at Sandra's house with the, uh, with the young adults. Imagine it was so packed and somebody says, you know what, let's break open Sandra's roof to bring some. K Kimball, you'd be saying, somebody better fix that roof. Before y'all leave, y'all better fix that roof, right? But he came, and how hard did the guy work to get to Jesus? His friends brought him. What, how hard did he work to get his healing? He didn't really work that hard at all. But because of the work of another, and that's the point I'm trying to make about this new covenant, because of the work of another, it actually brings you in. And your job, your responsibility, your duty, your work is to say, yep, I agree with that. God who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be called the righteousness of God in Christ. That's in the book of Romans. How hard did you work to be called the righteousness of God in Christ? You just have to believe it. It's like when you log on to your www.sinbank.com, what does it read all the time? Zero. Oh, okay, I guess that what it reads. How hard does it take because you're in him? Does, does it mean that you wouldn't mess up? Does it mean that you wouldn't have a problem? Does it mean that you wouldn't mock up sometimes? Of course not. But God is not judging your righteousness based on you. Your righteousness is like a filthy rag before him. Christ's righteousness is perfect. Christ's righteousness is in that covenant. Christ's righteousness is the one that we say, that's in whom I stand. So this covenant, this new covenant, 
it's somebody's got to do something and it wasn't you and blood had to have been shed, right? With, with this new covenant in, in Hebrews 8, it says, he made the first one obsolete by what by whatever is becoming obsolete is growing old and disappear. So with the new covenant, number one, blood was shed. Number two, Jesus did something and you get to be included in what he did. Number three, the old covenant of work, the Bible says is obsolete. It's done. One of the words that's used in the text, and I forget, I think it's in the book of Romans, where it says it is, the old covenant is gone. The word actually translates to rendered inoperable. So it's like a total car. It's a car that you can't do anything with. That's what the law is. The law has been made inoperable where we don't have to participate in the law. We get to live from our relationship with God and not under the covenant, not under the old covenant. So, that, so, so when you think circumcision, we don't think snip, snip. What do we think? In Christ, right? So you're formerly Gentiles. You're now brought near by the blood of Christ. I went over that. Everyone in the household gets the benefit. That's what I was just talking about. When the, you see the pass, he'll pass over you. I kind of ran through that piece. All right. Now, check this out in Galatians. So we're going through and we're thinking about this new covenant thing. We're thinking about the blessings of Abraham. We're thinking about what's included. This Galatians 3 and 28 passage says, here is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor the free man. There's neither male or female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. So that text, that's Galatians, that's Paul singing his song really well on key um, for, for, for humanity. He's really telling the story well about what it means to look like in Christ. Because oftentimes, like, I, I, I try to read this for Kayla all the time. Kayla, there's no Greek. Like, you got to take that Greek. <laughs> <laughs> but there's neither Jew nor Greek. That, that's a symbol of nationality. God's kind of erased that whole story, right? God's kind of, so if, so, so if Kayla says, I'm a Greek first and a Christian later, you know what she needs to do? Repent, <laughs> Right? If she says, I'm a Greek first and I'm in Christ second, she needs to repent. Because what, what the text saying? It says there's neither Jew nor Greek, no slave nor free, no male or female, but all one in Christ Jesus, all in Christ Jesus. So everyone gets a chance to participate in this thing called Christ Jesus. So what's the response of all? Yes, Lord. I'll take it. What's the response of the Muslim? He has to say, yes, Lord. Yes. What's the response of the Jew? He's got to say, yes, Lord. What's the response of anyone? Yes, I take a moment to say, yes, I agree with the fact. I, I don't put the umbrella on. I throw in the umbrella. I say, bring it on. Bring it on. I want to receive the fullness of the benefit of what's in Christ Jesus. And then you are Abraham's descendants according to promise. You're, you're, you're Abraham's descendants, Abraham's seed. When Paul is thinking about this, Paul being a Jew, they all know, hey man, when you start talking Abraham's descendants, you're talking about the guys who are in. When you start talking about the promise, you're talking about the guys who are there, they're in. And Paul is saying, hey, you thought that because you were circumcised, you thought that because you had the circumcision, that puts you in already? Nuh-uh. There's no Jew. There's no Greek. There's no bond. No, I'm sorry, no slave, no free, no male, no female. But all, all 
are one yeah. in Christ. Once they've said, hey, yes, I receive this thing. And they, yeah. they, they, they descend. So that's what I believe would have been going on in the mind of Paul when he says, hey, you're, you're Abraham's descendants. You're Abraham's descendants. You're, you're, you're in him. It's a couple more scriptures we'll walk through on this. Now, here, I want to make the point again as to the descendants of Abraham, those who are in the covenant, aren't the ones that just had a snip snip or their family had a snip. But the ones that are in the covenant, the ones that are in him, are the ones that Paul makes a decision. He points them and he calls them and he says, you're the one that's in. Check this text out, Galatians 15. And by the way, Paul goes on a rampage, it, it seems, in the book of Galatians, talking about circumcision. Like, it's in almost every one of the chapters. Circumcise this, circumcise that, circumcise the other. And I think there were two reasons. Number one, there were the people who came out of Judaism and they were serving Jesus. And they start to say, hey, you guys are serving Jesus now. You know what? You got to go see the rabbi and you got to get a snip. And Paul was like, uh-uh, that's not how it works. Because the circumcision that we're talking about is not the circumcision made by hands. It is the circumcision that when Christ was cut, he was cut and he bled for you. You were included in what Christ did on the cross. So the circumcision not by hands. So check this out. For neither, for neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So he's pointing out, guys, don't worry about the circumcision thing anymore. It's not a big deal. It's not what we're talking about. It's not the snip down there, but it's the one here. It's the one that you have been placed into Christ. That's of importance. So he said, is this circumcision or circumcision? But a new creation. And that's a reference, of course, to he that is in Christ is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. So you're no longer Jew, Greek, bond, free, male, female, but you're in Christ Jesus. So he says, and though, verse 16, and those who will walk by this rule, may peace and mercy be upon them, upon the Israel of God. By the way, that wasn't a real term. Paul made that up. I think... I think scholars agree with me that Paul made up that term, the Israel of God. Not God's chosen people. He called himself, the, the, he called this group the Israel of God because remember, he's a Jew, he's a Pharisee. He's thinking these people, the Israelites know that we're the ones that are in. So if you notice that term Israel of God, and, and j just for reference, here's what Paul did. Um, as he's, walking through like basically crafting what we read as the new covenant today he goes and he makes up a term and, and people make up terms all the time and, and it's a very common thing what paul did he wasn't like being out of whack by doing this and i, I was just thinking about it do, do you know that the um does anybody know the history of the word podcast interestingly enough in 2004 a guy who was doing uh, he was on his Apple iPod, and he was making these audio blogs on his Apple iPod. He wanted to do an iPod broadcast, and thus became the first podcast. Before 2004, did anybody know what a podcast was? I didn't know what a podcast was. I'm going to be a podcast tomorrow. It's going to be great. I didn't even know what a podcast was. So Paul makes up a term. He's literally making this term up. And I believe what this term is saying, as, as I read the full totality of scripture, he is saying, those that are in Christ are the Israel of God. So let me put it to you this way. If someone's a Jew and they've not decided and this to acknowledge Christ, they don't count as the Israel of God. Not by, it's not by nationality. It's not by whether you're male or female. It's not by how you were brought up. It's by saying, I choose to say, yes, Lord. That's how you get categorized in this in Israel of God. So 
Paul's not doing something called replacement theology. And there's a thought out there. Replacement theology is when Christ came, he kicked Israel out and he made this thing called the church. I don't really hold to that. Um, he's not saying that there's no such thing as Israel. What he is saying is that the Israel that God puts his eyes on is the ones that have faith in Christ. The ones that are saying, I, am, I have decided to become awakened to the reality of the gospel, awakened and saying, yes, I receive, awakened to what Christ has done. Yeah. That's the Israel of God. Amen. I think this is, you probably remember me saying Colossians and Ephesians are almost, it, it almost feels like when Paul was writing Ephesians, he kind of rolled his pen and continued to write Colossians. The timeline is very similar. Um, some of the thoughts and the concepts are really similar in, in Colossians and Ephesians. And Paul kind of says, um, th this text is very close because remember we just read Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13 and this is Paul writing something in Ephesians chapter I'm sorry Colossians chapter uh, 2 and verse 11 and 12 and he says and in him you were circumcised in other words you're in a covenant which was performed without hands remember how the first Ephesians 2 says that original circumcision was performed by hands this circumcision was not performed by hands. It is Christ freely and willingly giving up his life for you. God wasn't angry with Jesus and he says, God wasn't angry with the world and he said, Jesus stepped in and says, you know what, God, let me be the good guy on behalf of those bad people. No, Jesus willingly and freely gave up his life. So he says, you who were circumcised with circumcision performed without hands in the removal of your body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Your circumcision was not performed by hands. And look at how Paul kind of ties in baptism here. Remember when we talk, talked about and we talked about baptism, the Bible says there's one baptism. And baptism is you saying, I'm, you're going down and being raised back into newness of life. It, it is something, for lack of a word, mysterious, mystical that happens in baptism, right? Your baptism took place 2,000 years ago. In 2017, or whenever you got baptized, you came into alignment with what Christ has already done, right? He said, the Bible says it's one baptism. And this is the baptism that's references, referencing. He says, so think of it. Circumcised in Christ, you're brought into this covenant, and you're brought into this covenant when what happened? When Christ died on the cross, he goes down and he raises back up, and you are now raised to newness of life. You're raised in him, you're raised to newness of life because of what Christ has done. It look, it says, raised to him through faith in the working of God. It is the faith of God wherewith you become raised up in him. So what was your, were you around, were you born 2000 years ago? Obviously not. But back then, if you read verse 12, having been buried, with him in baptism, in which you were also raised in him. So you got buried in him, you got raised in him. What's the first part of the text says? And in him, you were also circumcised. He's now giving a good definition here for the circumcision. This is Paul's definition for the person that's in Christ. Paul is saying, you were also in him circumcised with a circumcision performed not by hands. So it didn't look like snip, snip. It didn't look like an eight, eight day thing in a bris. What it looked like, it looked like this. P performed without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh of Christ, sorry, b body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Yeah. Obviously he's not talking about Christ being born as a Jew and the eighth day when Christ was born as a Jew, he got his snip. It's not that, it, it can't be that he's talking about. 
But what he's talking about as you read the rest of the text, he's talking about Christ's burial and resurrection. So he's saying, having been buried in, with him in baptism, in which you were also raised in him through faith in the working of God. That's great news, David. I'm telling you. So your circumcision was not done by hand. The covenant that you came into, the covenant that Christ is in, that you are included in, that you woke up to one day in your life at some point, that covenant that you are in came when Christ went down, was buried, and raised up. That word baptism means to be immersed. That's all it means. It's just a Greek word that means to be immersed. So you got immersed into Christ. And what were you raised to? Newness of life. That's what happened to you. How hard was that? Did you have to, eh, I'm going to get raised to newness of life. I'm going to pray this thing into being raised into newness of life. It doesn't work like that. It works from rest. It works from a posture of the heart that says, I will allow what Christ has done in me to work through me. Yeah. Servants, the Bible says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Mm. Lovers always get more work done than servants do. This scripture shouldn't lead you to say, hey man, let's just kick our feet back and we could just do nothing for the rest of our lives. No, when the grace of God begins to instruct your hearts, you begin to say, I see what I'm supposed to do now. I see how my life becomes a living sacrifice. I, I now understand the purpose for which you've called me, why I'm alive breathing, because I've understood that my circumcision was not performed by hands. I was buried and I came back in newness of life. When you experience that newness of life, your life is different. Your life has changed. You're right. completely a brand new creation in oh, Christ yeah. Jesus. You are new. You're in him. You're in, you're in, you're in, yeah. you're in, you're in yeah. Christ Jesus. All right. <laughs> I, I, th I think of myself, how, how hard did Lawson have to work to get to church today? It's all because, of, all because of Larry's work. He just gets to participate in that. Lawson carries Larry's name. How hard did you have to work to be included in what Christ did? It wasn't a work that was done on your behalf. You, if, I don't know if you remember, the, um, in the old covenant, when the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would wear a certain type of garment that would not make him sweat. And the purpose of it is that if he is sweating, it assumes that he's working. So he, was, he did everything to not sweat. When you're coming into the presence of God, once you understand you're in Christ, the effort on your part is come. There's no work required on your part. Your work is to say, I believe this thing. Yeah. I really believe this thing. And my, my point is, I'm, I'm hoping that you get a revelation of what it means to believe what Christ has done in you. Because as you recognize what Christ has done in you, it changes the way in which you live. Your striving be goes away. And I said this two weeks ago, there's two things that happen. W the reason why this message gets fight fought down a lot is two reasons. Number one, there's the one who is like striving to perform. And he's like, man, let me tell you something. Blessed are the meek, I'll show you meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit, I'm going to show you poor in spirit. And there's this striving. But then there's this other category that says, hey, man, I'm the performance police. I'm going to make sure that you pray. I'm going to make sure that you fasting. I'm going to make sure that you doing, 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 doing. Friends, let me tell you something. If you keep doing, 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 you'll end up in doo-doo. Keep do, do, doing, you'll be in doo-doo. Uh-huh. Not eh, uh -huh. that's, that's where you end up. You end up in the muck of performance. 
you end up in the muck of trying to achieve, strive to achieve something that you already have. It kind of takes the form and it looks like this, like, man, we, it, it, we're doing a lot more. But when that, it, the Message Bible puts it this way, um, for that uh, Matthew uh, 11 passage, where it talks about living in the unforced yeah. rhythms of wow. grace. I don't know if you've ever been to the ocean and you put like a little ball in the ocean. And before long, that, where does that, does that ball kind of stay where it is? No, it kind of drifts and it drifts here, it drifts there. It, before long, it's doing all these kind of drifting thing and it is all taken all the way to the, wherever it's going. How hard did the ball work to drift? It didn't. The ball was in an unforced rhythm of the ocean. And because it's in the unforced rhythms of the ocean, the ocean took it where it should be. That's what your life should look like, living in an unforced rhythm of what Christ is doing. And so the practical level, it might mean, hey, you know what today? Today we'll make today a rest day. You know what tomorrow is? You might work 18 hours. The day after, 18 hours. I'm talking about at your job or at your business or whatever dreams and visions you may have. And God may say to you, I want you to take a little break. I want you to take a little rest from this. But God, I've, I've, I've got things to do. I've got, I want to do this. When the Lord speaks to your heart, he will show you what the unforced rhythms of grace is. And he will speak to your heart and your heart will begin to recognize what he's saying and what he's doing. All right. So I've got the trouble stick again. There we go. I got the trouble stick. All right. Could we put on the trouble stick? Trouble stick in action. Yes, it's here. All right. So here, here's, here's what I'm going to do. If you're new to our congregation, one of the things that I, I want to do and I want to make sure that happens is that when I teach something or when I share something, if you have a question, if you have a question on what was shared, I want you to come and ask a question. Come and ask a question. If you don't get something, it wasn't clear, come and ask a question, right? Now, don't come up here and preach, right? Don't come up here and tell me what a vision you had in 1975. Look, <laughs> you know, I, I'm getting so old, it's getting older. Back in the day when I see a vision of 1975, that was like 20 years ago. But now, <laughs> That's, that's a very long time ago. You don't tell me what a vision you had in 2005, right? That's a little more modern, right? Don't tell me what a 10-year-old vision, right? Don't, don't, don't tell me about what you want to preach about. But if you've got a question about what was asked, I, I, I want to hear your question. I want, I want, 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 want you to, to come and share your question. So come on up. So as I'm, as I'm answering the question, I can't guarantee right answers. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Hello. Yep. How are you doing, sir? Doing good. All right. My question is, um, so regarding the circumcision, um, you mentioned in Genesis, um, which would be like the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, do you think in in the Old Testament they the perception of of circumcision was like uh, the act of doing something physical and do you think in the with the new testament um it was more an act of uh, being spiritual and, and accepting of god so a very good question so in the old testament it was literally a physical thing as we read in genesis chapter 17 verse 10 it says and you shall circumcise every male their foreskin that was pretty literal. That wasn't a spiritual, that was pretty literal. That was happening culturally speaking. And I, I looked, at a, uh, looked it up. I think, well, most of the Jewish world, all the Jewish world still does it. And I think it's like 50% uh, or more of babies that are born are, are still being circumcised, right? So it's still, you could still go to one of those circumcision parties as of today, right? In a new covenant, He's not, when you think circumcision, just like when I say hasta la vista, baby, you're thinking Terminator. When you think of hasta la vista, baby, you're not thinking, oh, let's have this wonderful little baby. 
you're thinking the Terminator story. So when in the new covenant, you think circumcision, you're thinking covenant because uh, Genesis chapter 17 says, and when you circumcise your son, your male, this shall be a sign to you of my covenant to you. So my, uh, this is a question based off piggyback off of that. Of course, please. Um, do you think the Old Testament has uh, that remnants of like active um, uh, to show your to show that you're in in the physicality aspect? And do you think maybe the New Testament shows the that you're in in spiritually? Or so I don't know if that's too broad or so. Try to reframe the question a little bit. So let's talk about the Old Testament piece question you're trying to ask. You're saying that in the are you saying that us as modern day believers, we could look to the Old Testament as a form of covenant? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, all right. So, so the answer biblically is no, because all throughout the New Testament, Paul, Jesus, Jesus came to abolish the law. Paul basically, I'm sorry, not Paul, the writer of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews, I think, 16 chapters. The writer of that book spent the entire book talking to, it's no secret, it's in the name Hebrews. He was talking to Jews, right? The author, we don't know who the author of the book of Hebrews is, but he spent the entire book telling the Hebrews, <clears throat> don't go back. Don't go back to Judaism. I know it's 1,500 years of history, but do not go back to the law please whatever you do because if you go back to the law you are insulting jesus because jesus came paid the price he made the ultimate sacrifice for us and we receive that sacrifice and we're saying jesus thanks for that sacrifice but i'm gonna do some law jesus be like come on i did this so you don't have to do that amen Thank you. Really great question. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Julian. Who, who else? Come on, Larry. All right. Step, step forward so you don't come for that speaker. Yeah, okay. sure. Um, so my question uh, should be pretty straightforward then. Uh, do you think, what's your opinion on modern day circumcision then? Do you think it's based on... Uh, the texts that we read, do you think that it's necessary or unnecessary? Are you asking if right, it's- let me, rephrase, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase. Um, what's, your, what's your opinion on a modern day circumcision? As a spiritual act, as an act for do, physical- The physical, physical act. Because it would, you would think by reading the, the, the New Testament that it's completely unnecessary than the physical act of it. So, so spiritually, it's not necessary. I, I can't find a text that supports the fact that spiritually, it's necessary. Physically, that's a decision between you and your doctor. Like that. <laughs> Please I, do I, consult I, your I, own physician. I, yeah, okay. I, I understand. I, I did a terrible job of phrasing. That's okay. I, 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 I meant this, I meant this in, the spiritual, in the spiritual way now is that do you think the physical act is completely completely irrelevant then. Correct. I believe that this, the physical act does nothing because the circumcision, but let's read it right there. By the removal of the body in the flesh, the circumcision of Christ having been buried um, in baptism, we also raised in the of life through the working of God. It says, first, first line, and in him, you were also circumcised. He's telling me I'm circumcised. He's he didn't, he didn't tell me I went to the doctor to get a snip. He's telling me I'm circumcised with a circumcision that's performed without hands. But as I read that, I'm kind of getting some um, thoughts on your question. But do I, if I did the physical, I know I'm spiritually circumcised. That's what that text is saying. The question I think you're asking, and you may not be asking, is does the physical act have a spiritual implication that has a spiritual implication yeah yeah because i mean obviously this the, the new testament is kind of it's 
in a way that the covenant supersedes the Old Testament, but yeah. at the same time, the, the stuff in the Old Testament, I don't think is, I think it's still important. So that's why. Right. Uh, so so the, the way the Bible refers to the Old Covenant, it says it's rendered obsolete. And the Bible says... Oh, that's what, pretty straightforward. That's pretty straightforward. Okay. <laughs> okay it's not, not hard to convince this guy. All right. Very good. Well, thank you, Larry. If you got another question, we got some time. I, I wanted to make sure and get some time for questions in this one. Rendered inoperable is the word in the, 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 the translation. Um, good. Great question, Larry. Great question. The, the law is done away with. The law is, is gone. We, we, we don't live under the law, right? And, and it's, it's re, the case to say that we don't live under the law is fairly easy, right? Like it's an easy case because it, 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 if, we, if we had to live under the law, then we, we, we need to have sacrifice and Passover lambs, right? Which in one says not to, like if barbecue every uh, Sunday, Saturday, sounds like a great idea anyway, right? <laughs> well, we, we, you have to get sacrifice, you have to get lambs, and you have to sacrifice, and you have to bring sacrifices. If, if the law is necessary still, you, you have to make sacrifices. If the law is still necessary, if your house has mildew, you have to knock it down. It's in law, right? You gotta, you gotta knock your house down, right? Man, it's South Florida. It kind of gets humid around here. I don't want to tell you. I, I pay someone to wash the, clean my bathroom, and it's also mildew in my bathroom, especially Aaron's bathroom, right? If, if, so if, 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 if the law is necessary, if we, if we have to do the law, you can't wear polyester. You can't blend cloths. The law is ne Yeah. I don't know what this pants is made of. If the law is necessary, right? When you have a disobedient child, you take them all back and you stone them. Who would still be here if the law was necessary? Who would still be in this room if the law was necessary? Right? Right? Because if you break one law, you've broken all of them. You can't, you can't, hold, you can Jesus came and his whole point is you cannot keep the law. It is impossible to keep the law. And of course, forget your Fourth of July barbecue. You've got to put veggie pies on the thing. No, no, no pork for you. No shrimp for you. No, and that's beef, so that might work. That's 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 that, that's that's good. That's good. If 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 the law is necessary, you 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 can't do those things, right? Um, and and I think there's some ceremonial laws about when women have their monthly time. What you have to do to to keep them away and yeah. keep them outside the camp and. I'm like, am I? You're unclean? In, in great Jesus says, call nothing I've made unclean. I'm telling you. All right, Sandra. Yeah, so we won't get that feedback over this. So my question is with reference to um, those Christians that I, we know they're Christians, they are born again, but are having a hard time transitioning into, you know, that, the, the new the, covenant the, yeah the new covenant so when they they speak to you and they tell you oh but it makes me feel at peace or i feel that i do it out of love whatever those things that they do but when you say okay well how about killing a lamb how does that make you feel oh no that's awful so how do <laughs> how do you help those people because there are emotions involved right they're saying this feels good so you know i do these things that feel good but when how come the other part that they don't like does not feel good so as kind as i possibly could say if i if there's a thing that's been rendered inoperable and i okay so I, I still got my old 17 year old car in, in my house. Yeah, it's still there. I'm still trying that. to get a sale for it. My old 17 year old car, I'm waiting to <laughs> try to get a sale for it. I'm trying to give it away to somebody who will take care of my old 17 year old baby. <laughs> right? <laughs> what if I go back? I, 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 in that car, I have had tears of joy, tears of laughter. That wasn't the car I brought Aaron home in. Was not the car I brought here, but 
when Aaron was a baby, I took him around in that car. I took Aaron to the park in that car. I, in that car, it took me to work at a job that I, I didn't like, but I knew that my purpose was, was in there. And I walked through, um, I, I was waiting for my green card in that car and, and cried in that car many days and nights. Um, a, a stone, a pebble bobbed and popped the, 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 the windshield. I had to replace the windshield in, in, in that car. Um, and, and lots of stuff with that, that. I'm very attached to that car, right? I'm very oh, attached to that car. I'm very attached to that. But I've got a car payment that says that that old one is rendered inoperable. <laughs> I've got a new car that's sitting in my driveway that I enjoy driving. It's there. And, and literally a week ago, because I say, you know what, if somebody's going to sell, if I'm going to sell it, because it hasn't been driven for about two months, I should just go in, make sure it's still driving and make sure everything's so I jumped in the car and I started up. And I was like, oh, it's, it's mouse. Mm. I'm in mouse again. <laughs> and I drove it around the block a little bit. And I had this feeling of, right. oh. It's really like, but does it make any sense for me to be constantly going back to that car? Does that mean it's there when the person buys it and I have to wave mouse by, don't cry for me, don't shed a tear, the times I spent with you will always be. I mean, I, I might sing that. But that car is not something that I it is done it is gone wouldn't it be creepy if i knew who the owner was and when i you gave the car away or sold it i would go drive around the neighborhood and go look at the car and say oh it's mouse it's my old car isn't she pretty oh my God. you remember the days when we used to when we cried together and we laughed together and we that would be creepy right that's wow. what it's like when you're saying, let me just hold on to a little bit of the law. Let me just get a little piece of it. Let me hold on to a little bit of this law because Christ has rendered the law inoperable. Which I, you know, I, and that, that was the second question I have. So the scripture seems to be very clear. Like, well, you know, he said, oh, I'm done. Yeah. Why? That's it. Like, I cannot argue with that. I can't argue with that. So, but for those people that are having a hard time, then we, it, it's safe to say that we should lead them into some sort of deliverance, spiritually delivered from those attachments that they have, because it sounds to me like you're saying it, they're attached to certain emotions that these things make them feel when they do them. I, I think so. My, my wife's a trained mental health counselor. Her office hours are Monday. <laughs> 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 yes, I, I think it could yeah. be an attachment. I, I, I don't have a good biblical grid but i think that's part of it there is an attachment to the law there is an attachment to heritage like so, it's hard to let go of certain of, right, these that represents they're, family they're, and it's yes. the meals and that you know it makes you feel good because you see your family all together yes but you know so there is these emotions Absolutely. that are attached to that doing of that yes so yes. it's not it's more like i'm doing it just because it's part of the law and i think god will be happy with me it's Little, so you're it's, telling me that I, it's literally an attachment, that is my something guess. that you're bound to emotionally. That's my that's guess. Okay, that is my I guess. That's sure. my, my guess. Th thank you, Sandra. Like David um, was born and, and raised Jewish, right? Um, when David, when he started to understand um, what, Matthew 24 specifically and um, an eschatological view of God, the first thing that he said, he, he had to put away those tapes and he had a, no, it wasn't a tape. It was a YouTube video. I'm sorry. <laughs> who, who still has a tape ministry? We don't have a tape ministry. There's no tape. Eh? Yeah, that's the time to say, eh? There's no tapes. He's watching these YouTube videos and he, he, he had an understanding of the grace of God and God's grace was there for him. And then he started to watch these videos on what it actually looks like in Matthew 24. And he says, he had to put it away. How long did he put it? About a year? He put it away for, he's like, I can't hear this. I, I can't listen to the Dr. House of the world, the Rick Schmitz of the world, the 
uh, Paul White said, I can't listen to it because I feel like if I am, what was the word you used? I, he felt like a traitor to his people. That was the language that David showed me. He felt like he was a traitor to his people by saying it. But then he came into understanding of there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, but all one in Christ Jesus. He recognized there's the Israel of God. And that Israel of God is everyone who believes. And so now do you feel like a traitor anymore? You've been free from traitors. Yeah. All right. You've been set free. Freedom. You've got free. Just like song about free. You dance with those guys doing the freedom dance. That was great. <laughs> I'm going to take one more question if necessary. If not, because we got to go to Fat Stalk after. <laughs> yeah. I um, I, I'm come on up. Yeah, you, you, I'm sorry. You can't just get the answer from there. It, it helps on the, the equipment. My, mine was just a simple question is just um where did you uh reference that matthew's what um, matthew what uh the matthew 24 yeah is it um right here matthew 24 right or right so in matthew 24 not, not to get too deep into this this is what is called the olivet discourse okay. and the olivet discourse um is typically viewed as um it, it where, where is here yeah I, I know i'm looking for the verse that i'm okay i don't know that's why i was i wasn't sure exactly the the verse yeah, it's, it's a <laughs> it, and we just finished that five-week class five weeks ago <laughs> thursday was the last day to, a, to answer that it's, it's a fairly lengthy question um but but if you want to have some dialogue with David, he's happy to get, get his phone yeah, number yeah, and have yeah. some dialogue with him. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, of course. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's, that's great. Yeah, we, we we just finished a five week course course on, on eschatology. It was was amazing. Thelma said it was amazing. It was so good. I'm listening. I'm watching uh, Shana and um, Daniel. I was like, "What's your first exposure to eschatology?" This one. I was like, "You're so lucky! Oh my God! This is all you know. This is all you know." All right. Um, so this is great. All right, let's stand.